Up with tonight. The leak seemed intended to weaken Tony Abbott. Someone in Cabinet, maybe a couple of people, told a confirmed Abbott hater in the Sydney Morning Herald that six ministers, including Abbott rivals Malcolm Turnbull and Julie Bishop, were against his proposal to strip citizenship from terrorism suspects if they could claim citizenship of another country. So who would want to make Abbott seem like he hadn't consulted enough again? That he'd overreached again? Not me, said the two ministers who four months ago were reportedly about to replace Abbott. Can I tell you, I don't leak from Cabinet meetings and I didn't leak, I didn't leak from the last one either. Well, it absolutely did not come from me and the media, the press gallery, know that. Well, if the leak was meant to embarrass Abbott, it backfired. More than 40 coalition backbenchers, including several who'd voted against him in the leadership spill, signed a letter backing Abbott's stand. And Abbott just poured the pressure onto Labor to match that stand, which it eventually did. Well, joining me is Nikki Sava, columnist with The Australian, Bruce Hawker, former campaign guru for the Labor Party. Was that leak just a big backfire? Um, look, I agree uh, in one sense that superficially it has strengthened um, Abbott's position within the party. But I think um, you have to look beyond that and once you do drill down into it, I think it has caused uh, significant damage to the infrastructure of the Cabinet and of the government itself. I think um, it's all very well to start pointing the finger at um, Julie Bishop or Malcolm Turnbull. We don't know who leaked. Uh, we are not completely certain what the motives are. But there were more than two people in that cabinet room who were uh, violently opposed to what was being proposed. Not violently opposed. Well, Kevin well, Andrews merely said, for example, well, hey, listen, if we've got this debate here, let's, let's uh, not take it to the Barnaby public. Barnaby Joyce was um, pretty strongly opposed. Christopher Pine was uh, pretty strongly opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, these are very um, senior people uh, within the cabinet Agreed. with quite serious reservations and quite well-based reservations. And what they are objected to also was the way um, they tried to sneak it in. I think if there had been a proper process that was followed, we might not have seen uh, the events that followed. That's right, that's right. But up to that point, you have a serious discussion with a good outcome in Cabinet. Fine. The difference was the leak. That made it an act of treachery and a real political problem. Bruce, um, both Bruce Bishop and Turnbull said no, they didn't leak. But Peter Harcher, the journalist who was leaked too, uh, yesterday wrote that of course ministers would deny leaking, otherwise they'd lose their jobs, and he, he dumped them in it, didn't he? Well, I think any number of ministers have now denied being the source of the leak, as Nikki just pointed out. So I'm not going to be the one who's going to say it was Turnbull or it was Bishop. But what, I will, I. But what I will say is that... I think it effectively wedged them. It might have intended to be a wedge against the Labor Party, but the people who it really wedged were Bishop and Turnbull. And you've got to ask to what extent there was some uh, thinking that went into that before the whole exercise un unfolded. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, well maybe. But um, with the opposition, what, here's what I find interesting. It's come from Turnbull, Bishop, Brandis, etc., etc., uh, uh, from Liberals. And... Labor, Labor's left in particular, absolutely quiet. What is going on there? Um, um, weakness, I think. Weakness and um, hesitation, not being able to move fast enough with issues. I think it would have been a very simple matter for Shorten to say from the outset that um, Labor supported stripping dual nationals. I mean, this is the area that everybody agrees on. Everybody agrees that um, dual nationals should be stripped of their Australian citizenship. Where the dispute lies is with, <coughs> excuse me, sole citizens. So I don't think it would have hurt Shorten to have come out. Well, um, uh, look, he's said yes. <coughs> he's, I think he's very keen to say yes to everything. He doesn't want to be wedged like Bill, um, you know, uh, Beasley was on tampers and things like that. Um, is Shorten saying yes, Bruce, because he believes in this stuff or because he doesn't dare look soft? Because he made one damaging comment in the heat of the moment in the House of Representatives uh, during question time that Tony Abbott picked up. Have a look. What was the leader of the opposition's response? He said that was dog whistling. That's what he said. 
Bill Shorten leaned over and said, you're dog whistling. That was a bad mistake. Well, whether he was dog whistling or not, in the public debate, it's all about these terrible people and the terrible things they do. So I don't think that that is a particularly smart thing to do. However, I think you can ask, uh, you know, what's the motivation for all these things in part? I mean, politicians will sometimes say, look, this is good public policy, and it may well be, but they're also going to try to exploit it politically. And that's exactly what Abbott's doing Absolutely. right now. And, and he'll continue to do that. He's trying to exploit it against the people who would be replacing him as Prime Minister. He'll try to exploit it against the Labor Party, and we'll see more of that uh, as time goes on. It's, that's the stuff of politics. But it's interesting, this has highlighted Tony Abbott's recovery against his rivals and against Bill Shaw. Now, I always thought he could recover, but, but you didn't. Would you... What do you say? What's, what's behind this recovery? Uh, well, um, a whole number of things. Uh, firstly, what happened after February is that uh, people started looking a lot more closely at Shorten and found Shorten to be deficient. So, um, in comparison with uh, Shorten, Abbott looks a whole lot better. He has also, Abbott himself, has been uh, performing with a bit more confidence and uh, there's no doubt that the uh, budget was pretty well formulated and the budget cell itself, as far as it went, went uh, pretty well, although, you know, things kind of got a bit confused after that. But I think he has recovered from an incredibly low base. There's no doubt he is much better placed now than he was in February, but that doesn't mean he is back in a good place. He still mm. needs uh, a fair way to go. And yet there's a huge amount of confidence now on the front bench. They, I think they feel that they have got the next... their favourites for the next election, although there's a long, long way to go. Uh, the mm. thing is, uh, uh, Bruce... But they also know that it wouldn't take much for that... Um, that's to... always the case. Always the case. Um, but right now, Bruce, one of the upsides for the government will be in the next week when... Uh, you've got the ABC screening a new series, a uh, three-part series, about the battles between Kevin Rudd, your old boss, and uh, Julia Gillard, the two of them going at each other in this documentary called The Killing Season. Now, Gillard especially saying Rudd bullied her, right? He seemed a bit disturbed and all that kind of stuff. Why on earth are they going through all this again? Well, it's an historical document that they're working on, and the ABC does this after every government. And, uh, and I think it's quite a useful historical document because it gives the players an opportunity to be examined and interviewed at length about the issues. Was, uh, was Rudd a bully? Well, I, didn't, I never heard anybody say that in all the time that I was involved with it. So, but I'll say this... She never, I, I, Julia Gillard, you never heard Julia Gillard can, can, complain at the relevant not, time. Not privately. That man is a bully. Book? No, not privately. I mean, but, so this but is but news to you. Well, it is. But I'll tell you this, you know, obviously when he was making his challenge in 2012, a lot of outrageous things were said about him by people inside the party who wanted to put the stake through him, uh, you know, once and for all. So this is not inconsistent with those sorts of comments. But, you know, you had two very different personalities. You had in Gillard somebody who was solid but not brilliant, and in, uh, in right, you had someone not who was brilliant, brilliant but not solid. <laughs> so that was... That was I've got to get, the... One of the clashes between Gillard and Rudd is over Rudd's uh, so-called uh, Gang of Four style of government. Gang of Four referring to Mao Zedong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rudd making most of the decision was just Gillard, Wayne Swan, the Treasurer and Finance Minister Lindsay Tanner. Gillard claims she was against it. Have a look. The you know, four-person central committee of uh, me, Wayne, Kevin and Lindsay. Uh, it wasn't disbanded because, uh, in, I think in Kevin's view in particular, uh, he preferred to do business that way. Uh, that is the most um, creative uh, reconstruction of a political memory I've ever heard. Um, I remember Julia in particular enjoyed and liked the relative secrecy. I like the way uh, Gillard refers to it as the Central Committee. She <laughs> prefers the Soviet terminology. Uh, who's telling the truth there? Oh, well, I, I'm just... Everything that I'd read at the time suggested to me and, and that I heard was that all the participants in the Central Committee uh, were quite happy with the, uh, with the way in which the decisions were being made. Uh, subsequently, I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of criticism of that very closed decision-making. not at the time. 
Not to my knowledge. <laughs> well, well, she could have uh, lodged a protest and said, look, really, this is very unfair, Kevin. We should be including the whole cabinet. But we never heard anything about that. So, I recall it. Um, people seem wow. to like the cosy arrangement if they're inside it. Um, Who to believe? Probably neither. Coming up, the Treasurer says <laughs> we're clowns to think the economy is dark clouds ahead. Well, welcome to my circus after this. Some good economic news at last for the Abbott government this week. Growth for the March quarter was up 0.9%, more than what economists had predicted. A moment of sunshine, and the Treasurer went for it. Those numbers have uh, proven that there are some clowns out there that are talking about recession and, and dark clouds on the horizon. Uh, they've been proven to be looking foolish, those people. Unfortunately, that was followed by not-so-good news, flat retail sales and a record trade deficit. I'm back with Bruce Hawker and Nikki Sava. So how good was that? Well, uh, the figures were better than expected on national accounts. That doesn't mean that they were great figures, and they certainly need to be a lot higher than that if um, unemployment is to go down. So, yes, it was a relief on one hand, but then I think for Joe to be out there, you know, saying that people who, who doubted... Um, were clowns? Yeah, <laughs> doubted how wonderful it all was and what a beautiful set of figures they were, um, clowns and fools, I think, was... Still, um, you'd hope that the small business uh, package will kick in now and maybe, you well, know, that talk, should it up, show talk it up. up. That should show up um, in the next few months and in the next batch of figures, or so, so you would hope. And, but it's, it's a silly thing to do. It's one thing to talk up the economy, and I think Treasurer should do that. It's silly, though, to go out and make a bold declaration like that, knowing that things could turn down in the next quarter and he'll have to be wearing his red nose when he does the press conference. <laughs> but uh, there was uh, more cheer. Labor's agreed not to pass on the uh, tax cuts that were meant to compensate for the carbon tax. Uh, that's uh, $3 billion now of savings uh, that the government's uh, got. Labor's still against $20 billion others. Why did it finally cave? Oh, well, um, the legislation was coming up and I think um, Labor is now taking much more strategic decisions on what it's going to support and what it's going to oppose. It's clearly having another look at the uh, pensions tapered um, provisions and the I think... The Family we'll, Tax Benefit B? Uh, family Tax Benefit yeah. B, I think, will... Um, there might be tweaking there from Morrison, which might help, but there still seems pretty strong opposition uh, from Labor on, on that. But the age pension taper test, I think, they will they will move on. But they They have to... Do, they uh, have to start getting serious yeah. about endorsing some spending cuts. This is my big point about Bill Shorten and the team, and I think Chris Bowen is a big advocate for what we're seeing now in the, in the Labor caucus. Uh, in order to be a serious, serious contender at the next election, he has to be purer uh, than, uh, than Caesar's wife when it comes to this. He actually has to be demonstrating where the savings are going to be made for the spending initiatives, where they're going to make the cuts. And this is an indication of an intention to go down that path. If they do that, then they will go some way to neutralising what is always the big negative for Labor. I agree with you completely. Uh, the Royal Commission of Trade Unions heard uh, evidence uh, this week that Bill Shorten's former union, the AWU, had signed a deal with a company that exchanged money... In, so the, the company paid the union some money and in exchange the company could pay cleaners about $2 million a year less in overtime and other benefits. The question now is, what did Shorten know of such deals? Well, uh, at the moment he's getting away with this line about how he's not going to provide a running commentary on what is coming up before the Commission. At some point he will have to answer these um, allegations and, and they are quite serious. I mean, on, on one hand, it looks as if um, the poorest workers have been ripped off uh, to help um, the unions Bottom line. Increase the union membership level to give them a bigger voice <coughs> in uh, the uh, in the Labor affairs to are, allow people, people like Shorten to get elected. Looking after the workers uh, instead, they've would... been looking after themselves. Sure, so... This goes to the heart of structural issues inside the Labor Party that I've been on the record about talking about for a long time. You know, unions who bolster their membership numbers in order to get a bigger representation at the national conference can only lead, lead ultimately to tears for everybody. Uh, you know, the party really needs to have a very hard look 
at these structures, these practices, so that in time they, uh, you know, they actually change the way in which they operate. And uh, if they do that, then Labor will be a serious contender uh, in the future. But they really have to start thinking very seriously about some of these relationships. Um, same, Bill Shorten, on a more positive note, uh, gave a speech uh, to move a private member's bill on Monday, a rousing speech it was, on same-sex marriage. Have a look. Our laws should be a mirror, reflecting our great and generous country and our free, inclusive society. And our parliament should be a place where we make things happen. You excited yet? Well, uh, I actually am a supporter <laughs> on this issue, but I, uh, Bill did not move me with his speech, I've got to say. I, no? I didn't, oh. no, didn't sway me. The but... message isn't bad, though. <laughs> the delivery may, you may want to lift a bit, but the, the message isn't bad. The delivery is very important. Presentation is very important, and Bill doesn't have the pizzazz or whatever it is to carry these things off, but it's not helping... Um, the issue. Oh, well, at at the least moment. I think he's branded Labor as, you know, we want same sex marriage. It's interesting mm. the coalition, number of mm. uh, coalition MPs now are talking about bringing it to a plebiscite because they're not convinced that this has the public support, or perhaps even uh, rephrasing the move so that the state gets out of the marriage business. It's only there to recognise relationships and leave marriage to the churches and other people. Mm. You, what do you think of that? Well, I think there's something to be said for a plebiscite, I've got to say. I mean, if the politicians aren't prepared to make the hard decisions themselves, they feel that it's too difficult for whatever reason, then why not put it to the people? And I know what will happen when they do put it to the people. It'll, it'll, get, passed. it'll get passed. It'll get passed handsomely. And this is where uh, pandering to sectional interests either inside your own party or in uh, groups that support you is not really operating in the public interest. What I would say also is that there is a very serious move now I hear from within the Liberal Party caucus to try to close off moves towards a conscience vote that uh, Abbott might be flirting with. And Miranda Devine's got a piece on that in today's Telegraph. I think that's right. But I, I also think that the longer Abbott leaves it to resolve, uh, try and resolve this issue, the harder it will be for him to knock it off if he wants to knock it off. I think he was I trying to delay it so he talks to the economy and lets this uh, t yes, momentum see where it goes. But, but the issue will get stronger, I think, for mm. same-sex we'll marriage, we'll not, not less. That, that may well be true. Bruce Hawke and Nicky Saver, thank you so much for your time.